next up, agenda adjustments. I have a few, but like, did you want to do yours? Did you have any? Yes, I would like to add for under hiring, or excuse me, under employment, under C, I would like to add a visa staff year for assistant director of special services.
hopefully there'll be some clarification here in a minute. Of course, there's some specific that you wanted. Anybody could go in to be able to see those ballots if there's any questions. Yeah, it we don't go on record as how we voted, so I was trying to correct that. Something you might be trying to correct that in a minute. Okay. Anything else? All those in favor of the adjustments? As discussed, our adjustments as discussed. Yeah. Next up, uh, committee acknowledgments. And so what I will do is I will do first um, acknowledging the public concerns of last time. I can give you some notes that I have since I know you're taking notes for Jody. Um, so it was mentioned that there was a school enrollment pro projection study and the projection, projected numbers for the past year were between 580 and 598 students. And so, as Mr. Grant mentioned, on the website there's a more up-to-date document, and there's a 2019 projected date, and we're now right on schedule. So, projected for 2023 is 594 students at the high school, and we're just on that for the school year. Uh, next question that there was, was there was questions about um, the virtual vote and the roll call. And so, as our policy states, um, an individual committee member is able to attend virtually. I had gone with the roll call as an abundance of caution because it was pointed out to us, and that was not necessary. So, in the future, as long as we are able to see the person on the screen, we're able to take a vote, yay, nay, the same way that we normally would, because everybody is able to see that person. Um, so there were some questions around that. And there was also some concerns about um, committee members. And I really take this as an opportunity to say there's a lot, um, as committee members and the community that's gone on in the last year, there's been a lot of things that have said and done. Um, and so I really look for this as an opportunity for us to be able to collaborate together and to move forward as a committee. We're not always going to agree at everything, and quite frankly, I think that that's good. That's what makes a committee health, uh, healthy. We had a lot of great discussion last time. And so I just really look at us um, committee members and um, community members to move past that. Because again, there's been a lot of things that have been said and done that I think we all could agree that we could have done better over the last year. Um, the other thing that I just want to remind all committee members of is that executive session is completely, completely confidential, not to be discussed even in our families. Um, after the last meeting, there were, it, it could have been perceived that there was some topics that were discussed, that were discussed in our executive session outside of executive session. And we just can't have that moving forward. We've got to make sure that everything that we talk about in an executive session stays within that. And so I really look, I know myself as a committee member, I can do better. And I look forward to doing better and working together. And I just hope that we can all agree that that's why we're here for the kids and that we can move past some of the things that happened last year. Um, so that was what I had for addressing the public comment. As far as the co-chair, um, you know, I've heard the concerns that people had, and I'm using it as an opportunity. There's lessons learned, right? So there was a motion on the table last time that Chris was presented as co-chair. That motion should have been followed all the way through versus allowing a second motion to be on the table. So um, lesson learned that that should have happened. Um, there was no objection from any of the board as we did it, and that was the way that the board had chose to do it at that time. So because of that, I'm going to make a motion to move to confirm Chris as co-chair. We will um, say our votes out loud. And hold it. Do I need to second that? If you wish, yeah. Second. Any discussion? Any discussion? 
All those in favor? Okay, motion carries. Thank you. Uh, any opposed? Any opposed?
has experience representing such issues in court and before administrative agencies such as the FCC. Uh, I will uh, skip that. I wonder what else is being hidden by the school committee. Ms. Doyle, when you made your horrific accusation at the annual meeting, it was clear that the council only had the children's best interests in mind. It's been a year and nothing has changed in your IT department. When will their security be your priority? Thank you, Steve. I look forward to collaborating with you on that and following up. Next up, um, personnel. You have two resignations. The first is for Jeff Weaver. Jeff has been the IT director since uh, for the last 20 years. Um, obviously, not an ideal time for resignation to occur, uh, but he had the opportunity to go to a situation that really met his professional needs. Um, and so, obviously, uh, very excited for him and all the things that he did for the district. I think, uh, fortunately, um, as I told him, I said you can be a hero in 2000, and, and now you know it's it seems to be swinging back the other way. I did a lot of really great things for the town, and did some pretty amazing things for the town council, the town office, and, and certainly for the school district. Um, and uh, you know, I just I wish him the best of luck. Um, he was a, he was a very good employee, and he will be missed. And um, yeah, I wish him the best of luck in his new in his new role. Uh, the second resignation that you have is Lou uh, Frazier, and she is leaving uh, self contained and has another educational opportunity to move on to. And so, certainly, again, anytime somebody feels they're bettering their situation, uh, we obviously wish them the best of luck and appreciate their time and service for the district. So, those are the two resignations. Next up, transfers. Yes, I am seeking a motion to approve the transfer of Sam Good from the HMS self-contained uh, EdTech uh, room to the high school self-contained EdTech room. Uh, this is not uncommon for us at the EdTech educational technician level. Um, Sam has worked at the high school here, and a lot of times these transfers occur based upon the student need. So sometimes they're moving with a student that they might have been a one-on-one -on -one with or you know, based upon the number of students going into a program and graduating and leaving the program. Uh, so Sam will be coming back to the high school. He spent the last two years at the middle school. So I'm just seeking a motion to approve that. We have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Motion carried. Next up, employment. Yes, um, the uh, employee at the 44 library, can you switch this, Jenny Stahl? Um, I'm going to be uh, really excited, first of all, for uh, Mrs. Stahl. She um, has a wealth of experience in the educational setting, and um, she uh, graciously accepted the offer after the second, the first time around, and so we. Obviously, that's always a fun phone call to make. I appreciate Mr. Walsh for making that phone call. Um, but uh, uh, we were very impressed with her in her interview. I think she would be a very good fit. And thankfully, um, we got the news on our, our past candidate early enough where we were able to get Mrs. Stahl. She had a couple other offers on the table. Um, so, Jenny Stahl, recommended for the library media specialist. So second. Any discussion? Can I just verify that? Is that Brian? That, no. Uh -huh. Jesse. Great. Any discussion? All those in favor? Motion carries. We can have one more. Two more. Two, more. Uh, two from the agenda adjustment. I sent you the resumes today. Um, I'm recommending Alicia Stapieri for the position of Assistant Special Ed, Special Services Director. Um, had a really uh, nice conversation with her uh, earlier today. 
She has been in the district now for several years at the elementary school in the self contained room. Um, we really feel like she has a, a complementary skill set for um, that position. Uh, that position in particular, uh, there's many IEP meetings that this person oversees. Um, there's also a lot of hands on training in dealing with students, whether it be de escalation techniques, whether it's safety care training. Um, and she has she has the gamut of dealing with students who are either emotionally distressed or behaviorally distressed, whatever that might be. And obviously, um, uh, from an internal standpoint, we've got to watch her work for the last several years. So just uh, thrilling, very challenging to replace, but I told her today, we don't not hire because of the hole that we'll create, right? Um, it's just about fit. So Alicia Stavier, if you have assistant special services director. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? And then the other one was um, the other adjustment was for Lacey Guthier, Guthier. Uh, Lacey uh, has applied for the educational tech position at the Patricia Durham Elementary School. And uh, after that committee met and interviewed her, they felt very strongly about her. Uh, that's a general education position, a tech position and really feel like her experience is going to be uh, really beneficial to that building. So Lacey, I think it's group, group three, I was going to get wrong, but Lacey group three for that position. Move to approve. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Motion carries. Next up, uh, co-curricular. No, those are uh, as presented. Um, I would just highlight that obviously as we progress through one of the policies that in the future should the policy of coaching and evaluation go through tonight, varsity coaches will be something that you will be voting on uh, in the future. Not yet because we haven't passed the policy yet, but that's something that we would take uh, as a separate item. But right now this is for your information. He's already been hired at the, I think it was July, but it could have been true. Oh, that's fine. We're bringing all the new clients. Yes, this is all uh, basically fall, winter, some spring. Um, you'll notice there are some positions absent because they're just not, we don't have a candidate to bring forward. Any discussion? All those in favor? And then second reading of policy. So do we have a motion to approve the second reading of policy? Oh, yes. Did anyone wish to do public comment on the second reading of policy JJIBA1 and JLCD uh, administration of medication on those two? So do we have a motion to approve the second reading of policy JJIBA1 hiring and evaluation of coaches as presented?
I'll second. Any discussion on JLC? All those in favor? Next up, I want to open it up for public comment for the first reading of policy uh, JLCDD. This is a new policy. Close public comment. Do I have a motion to approve the first reading of policy JLCDD? I'll make a motion to approve the JLCDD regarding the lock zone. Any discussion on that? I do. I've got, I've got one point. Um, it was discussing policy, and, and I, didn't, it was in, I think it was just overlooked, Mr. Grant. And that was there's no legal disclaimer. I know we discussed that in relation to um, following policy as far as AEDs go. And the uh, policy in the AED states something to the, it includes something to the effect of although the school committee authorizes the acquisition of naloxone. Not, it does not guarantee that naloxone or a person trained in its use will be available at a particular school site or school sponsored. That, that, that's the same verbiage that's used for AEDs. And I think you just, it was just missed. I know it was discussed in the policy meeting. Is it in there that I missed it? it it's, it is in there. Um, it's about the, it's under use of naloxone. I see storage use. Follow. Yeah, so the use of the log stone, although the school committee authorizes the acquisition of the log stone. Yep. Yeah. Fire. Okay. Great, thank you. Any other discussion? Yeah. Yeah, what letter is it right? It's actually not a letter. It's uh, under use of the log stone, the second line down. I don't know if that's, um, I have sent this away to be reviewed. I don't know if they'll ask me to move that to a different card. It made sense to me to put it under use of, but it perhaps we got to watch out for the fees on the mic. Um, it might be better on your permissions, but I'll probably further clarification, but I, I really appreciate it. I thought that was really good feedback from the meeting and feel like we should definitely disclose our state that we offer, a you offer us, excuse me, but that doesn't mean that it could, would be used. One, can the audience hear Mr. Grant? You can? Okay. I see the speaker goes that way. Yeah? It doesn't go that way. There you go. Okay. Well, yeah. um, I agree. I was going to say something about the liability to treat these state staff, you know, if it wasn't available. So I think you will run that by the attorneys before the next Saturday. Okay, perfect. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Motion here. Would you just remind me who first and second it? Because I didn't write that down. I think I first did. Did you first write it? And then. Yeah. Yeah, you second it, right? Good, thank you. Next up, I want to open up public comment for the Main School Library Network agenda item. Close public comment. We have a motion to approve MSLN as the provider of the internet. So moved. Second. Any discussion? May I follow up with something from the tech committee meeting? So at the tech committee meeting, I hold on, just get my first here. Jesse. Jesse did that right, right? Thank you. Um, I had the opportunity to speak with Sorry, communicate, not speak, communicate with Mr. Henry. And there were a couple of questions that we had discussed regarding potential fees being waived at the beginning of the process and also how fast they could come into the school to hug out. We were initially under the impression it would take five to six months. Um, and we were hopeful that fees would be waived. So, good and bad, we were told that um, the fees would not be waived. So
So we will be on the hook for any fees and I'm waiting for the actual number. However, we were told they could come in in roughly three months. So that will be a significant uh, advantage to the district because if they could come in until after the contract expires for the first light, we would have to put it back out to the bid. Whereas MSLN will put the internet contract out to bid when they come in in three months and they'll take care of the EUA portion of that. Um, normally that would be our responsibility. So now MSLN, who's obviously very well versed in that, um, will be able to do that. So they can come in before our contract expires. They will not be waiving any of the hookup fees. I don't have that number yet. And we do have a rough idea that when the, when we are getting the rate reimbursement for that, it'll be about $350 a month. So it will be a significant savings to the district when they provide the internet for us. Any other discussion? So that would say that the median around the number Yes, it, it should be, it might even be October. Uh, I, I told him I would be contacting him tomorrow morning with the committee's decision. And then um, we have breakage fees for the first like for two months? Until the December. Until December, yeah. Which we obviously have budgeted for. So even, even if they're, if I just throw out a hypothetical, even if their bill is $1,000, to carry us from right, November, December through the end of the year. That's still, we budgeted 4,000 a month, roughly. So we, we're still going to have a significant savings, even if we're paying the full rate until June. So I had sent an email asking who is monitoring and running the network now. I, I didn't really get a straight answer. So can you clarify who is managing the network or if you're not here or how that works? Mr. Uh, Cohen. Yeah, who, our, our current IT department, which would be Mr. Owen and also uh, Mr. Aguirre. Any other discussion? Next up, the motion to nominate an alternative delegate for the MSBA Annual Delegate Assembly. Okay. Uh, I'm not waiting for Any discussion? All those in favor? Motion cares. Next up, I'd like to open it up for public comment for Alice. Alert, lockdown, and form, the front, and evaluate, evacuate. Close public comment.
So this is an agenda item that I wasn't 100% sure having talked to the board about. This is a direction in speaking with the administrative team in our, uh, several of our summer meetings. Um, we feel that our current lockdown procedure, basically it's, it's locked, stay in place, is, does not adequately address uh, how to respond to several safety situations. Um, and we have been able to confer, obviously, with the Homestead County Sheriff's Department as well in how we currently uh, try to protect our students. Um, I think there's obviously a common misconception that the lockdown is only used for an active shooter, and that is not the case. The lockdown can be used for a variety of situations. But um, in all cases, we feel like as an administrative team, it is critical that we empower our students and our staff to act and think and communicate than to huddle and hide and try to keep quiet. Um, we just, based upon several statistics that uh, Mr. Freeman is very well versed in because of his time at Mount View, uh, we know that that is really not good practice. Uh, and so it was decided at that meeting that the district would pursue Alice training. Um, and so uh, Mr. Freeman uh, uh, volunteered, if you will, was volunteered, um, similar to the MSN being a delegate, uh, that he would research and provide this information. And this is something that I, I would, I think ultimately like the school committee's approval and blessing in pursuing. Um, it will, it will obviously cost some money, but it is a complete philosophical change in the way that we currently conduct our Emergency, some of our, our emergency protocol. So I asked Mr. Freeman to come up and speak to a little bit of his own personal experience and you obviously have a brief uh, in your packet. Mr. Freeman, thank you. Thank you. Um, so I had the privilege of being at Mount View High School for six years and we went through over a half dozen critical incidents which required us to go down and walk down. Luckily there was no active threat, um, but we had several times where we had to go into lockdown. And because of that, we decided to investigate utilizing our school resource officer, research based methods on supporting students through critical incidents. Um, it could be active shooters, but they could also be threats. They could be um, additional things that we want to encourage students to protect them from. Um, the model that we adopted, um, which is kind of out of the run fight high model, but now it's called Alice, is alert. What you do first is you alert law enforcement, you alert administration, make sure that people are informed of what's going on. Be very specific in your alert, so if you alert if something is happening in the gymnasium. Second is um, lockdown. Lockdown doesn't look like the normal lockdown that you think of as in the corner of the classroom. What you do is in a classroom, you've got a large bookcase, you throw that out front of the door, you throw chairs out front the door, you put it so that way that room is impenetrable. Um, the next one is informed, so this comes from the administration and it's a loudspeaker call in plain language to the school saying there is a threat in the gymnasium. Because the reality is if we're in the school and there's a threat in the gymnasium, it may make sense for the front classrooms to evacuate to the fields. But without that information, they have no idea to get out of the building and go that way. So using plain language with students and with staff. Our next is confront. So sometimes you can't evacuate. So what you tell students is you grab the laptops, you grab anything you can have, and you actually front if someone comes through that door. You throw things at them, you make it so that they cannot get to you, and if you can, take down that individual. Lastly is uh, evacuate, I already said evacuate. Conform, confront, evacuate, thank you. Um, what this would entail is in October, myself, uh, Stephanie Beaverstein, and Melissa Davis, along with our school resource officer, Deputy Boyd, we go to Pittsfield for the training. They'll train the trainers. So what would happen is we get trained for two days. We would come back in November, and during the two days of November vacation that we have staff on site, we would train the high school staff on the first day, and we would train the middle school and elementary school staff on the second day. And then after that, we would create a plan to train all the students. Um, it looks different based on grade level. So elementary school level, you read books, and you can read very much like cartoon books to them because they're hard to understand and we want to make sure we don't scare kids. Middle school, you rent it up, but honestly, at high school level, at Mount View, we're training students what this would actually look like if something were to happen. Because the reality is we want every single person in that building knowing that 
you are empowered to do what you need to do to protect yourself at that moment. Any questions? At this time, I would take any questions, and certainly Mr. Freeman, I'm sure, would take questions about his own personal and professional experience with Alice. I like it. Uh, it closely resembles the training that I've had. I do have a, a one question that I, that I gleaned from it, and that is um, it's important to note that the Alice program should be implemented in conjunction with the guidance and support of local law enforcement agencies. Has the local law enforcement agencies done any sort of uh, survey of the facilities and then provided guidance so that they, the, the you are together, uh, they know what we're doing as far as Alice goes? Yes, I've had conversations with Deputy Boyd um, personally, um, and I do know that there are other schools in Knoxville County under the supervision of the Knoxville Sheriff's Office that also use Alice. This is something that would also be part of our fall conversations that we are, and we would keep them appraised of where we're at in the process, where we're at in regards to training. As you know, we had several agencies in here last week uh, doing drills. We have a very good working relationship with Palm Scott County. We'd like to keep it that way. And we would certainly, wherever Deputy Boyd or any of the administrators felt like he was paramount to bring them in, the, the door's wide open for them to come in and help us. So, did you say there was a cost involved and how that works with the budget and then the other? Yes, yeah. yeah, so the total cost of training will be, um, you can see it's uh, embedded in the second page of Mr. Freeman's outline. It's $2,996, about $750 a person. Our plan would be to have uh, uh, four people train. Uh, as you can see, one of them is uh, Deputy Boyd. Um, and um, we have money in our, uh, we, we budget money for courses, training, PD. So this is not going to be an extra cost. This is just something that, again, this is more philosophical. This is a change in the way we think and approach a certain or a very specific emergency situation. Yeah. I fully support that. I think it's a great idea, and I'm thankful that you guys are working on that. The other question is did you say this was yearly or so, um, fundamentally start and you kind of just practice? So um, that's a great question. The first training for um, Deputy Boy, myself, and whoever gets trained, whoever we decide to get trained, is two days. Um, then the staff training about three hours for the first year, and it's an hour follow-up generally each year after that. Um, in addition, you do train students because, again, you don't want to go to this model without training students to say, this is actually what we do now. You don't want them to do something completely different than teachers. Um, so you do train students, and that looks a little bit different the first year than the subsequent years. The first year, you actually do legitimate training to try to reprogram students like, this is what we do now instead of what we did before. After that, when you do your lockdown drills, you do lockdown drills that are more scenario based, and then you use the um, assets of Alice to do it. Well. Haley, you asked me about annual training for the trainers. Uh, do you need to go back and get trained every year as trainers? There's an online portal that we'll have to go through okay. each year. It's minimal cost, I think, $50 to get research every year. And so it, it'll be like a fire drill, the lockdown drill, well, that will incorporate is what you said. Sorry, yeah. I'm having a hard time. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you. Okay. Currently, uh, it is not uncommon for local law enforcement in Oscar County and Urban Fire to come in during a lockdown drill and an evacuation drill and time us to evaluate how quiet the rooms are. Now the lot will be flipped and we'll be able to bring them in for the actual live trainings of this as well. Separate but related is law enforcement or any sort of you know, personal protection when they did the training here earlier this week or last week, did they provide any sort of report or assessment of possible weaknesses that we could have within the school physically? Or, I mean, back in my day, I call it a threat assessment, but they would look at things such as windows that aren't properly covered, doors that aren't always locked. But was some, was, is that sort of assessment available for our district? So to answer your first question, no, we did not receive it. From their training last week, that wasn't for us, that was for them, but they got to sit and use a school. Deputy Boy, do you want to speak to are you, are there any threat assessments that Oscar County or another agency could provide us with? I'm 
So the last week and this upcoming week, I've attended the SRO school for the state of Maine to become a certified school resource officer. Part of our training this week is going to be threat assessment to actual physical buildings, uh, that type of security. The last couple of months that I was in the school, I did go around all the schools, I checked floors, found a couple of places where we needed some help. Those were addressed. We've taken care of those. But yes, once I get out of this training next week, I'll be certified in site assessments. I'd be very interested in, and I realize that isn't for public consumption, but I'd be very interested in as a school for us to sort of, as a midterm budget process, to look at those things that need to be done to make sure that our school is improved so that we take care of those things. So, again, I realize as an SRO, you can't share that with the public. As a, maybe as the safety committee, um, if they could look at that, it would be appreciated. I think this lines up well with uh, getting into those facility meetings and then having a time of, okay, now we're going to meet as a safety committee, talk to Debbie Lloyd, see where we can allocate money for we areas of weakness. Yeah. Yeah. I also think it's important to note that we go through our emergency plan every year. Um, Deputy Boyd, myself, Mr. Walsh, and Ms. Davis will be meeting next Wednesday um, before school starts to review our safety um, emergency plan. And one part of that plan is mitigation um, to look at all the different uh, types of events that could happen and how we get plans to make sure we address them appropriately. That plan will be provided to you before the September report. Obviously, I know um, making sure everyone's safe is the first priority, but word travels fast too. So, how do we communicate to the public if we were in lockdown and then we're secure? Does that make sense? So, um, we didn't have any at middle school that ended up us in lockdown last year, um, but, but that is it's an immediate, um, normally in the situation, central office is the communicator of information to the district while we manage the situation at school. A central office um, on situations where we can call ambulance, they're informed within seconds. Um, and that information is disseminated very quickly. Um, part of that inform the analysis to inform everybody and not just to inform the individual. Our emergency plan has a very clear, um, I would say chronological order of uh, if we were in a real lockdown there wasn't a drought that communication would go out from the central office to parents. There's pickup spot, there's pickup points for parents. We have evacuation secondary sites uh, throughout the town and we would begin communicating per that per, per that plan. Is there gonna be communication to if there was a drill? In my past district, yes, we would communicate that immediately and beforehand. Um, and when we do tra make the transfer over um, in my past district, and I was in here, we would send a letter to all parents saying, this is what we're doing now, and this is why we're doing it, um, making sure it's very well across the community that we are a Dallas teacher. Because when we do a drill, it's like a real life situation, and first responders are coming, or uh, how does that work? We inform first responders that we are going to conduct a drill, that way they don't get the alarm and come. Kind of obviously rushing in, uh, and I think anytime you perform a lockdown drill, it's important that you inform, but you are not going to be, this is the date, this is the time, and he's right, you say, we're going to do a drill this week, and that's how we prep the kids. We're going to do a lockdown drill, it's going to be sometime tomorrow, and so you want them to be aware, and there's certain people, for whether it's an IEP plan or something of that nature, that you make aware, but you, you do want there to be some element of it, it wakes us up. It, it has to be like it would be, you know, we have to simulate how it would be in real life. Uh, so we try to, it's like gradual release. We, we talk to them, we talk about training, what you do, we prep them, and ultimately when you have that first real life drill, you're hopefully doing it the way that you've practiced it many, many times. And speaking from the middle school, um, we immediately, within 10 minutes of doing a drill, post it on Facebook um, and inform parents through the weekly update to make sure they always know. Um, I think following up on Facebook at middle school and at all schools, we're very good about making sure we communicate those things out there. Any other discussion or questions? Real quickly on letting people know when we drill and when we don't drill. Obviously, we drill the kids for their practice, we drill the staff for their practice. 
what we don't want is the public knowing when we're actually drilling. Um, that creates other problems that we really don't need. They would know exactly what the protocols are, exactly when we're doing it, when we're at our most vulnerable, because it, during some of these drills, a lot of these students would be outside during some of these drills, and we don't want that. Thank you.
start providing like a uh, consolidation at the end of it so you can compare what STAR is telling you and then what the state results are, so if there's any correlation or validation between the two systems. They do have a uh, comparison and they do make predictive um, expectations for what you should be on the state assessment. Thanks. Um, I guess I have one question. It's kind of off the cuff here, but I, I think I met with you once and you were talking about how you were working with your teachers and looking at assessments and making plans. It's just a way to explain it. You've been very proactive at seeing, seeing the problems and making changes as needed. Do you want to speak to that at all? Because I think that's some of the concerns seeing those numbers coming in. Um, I'll say every one of the recommendations, or every one of the changes we're doing this year in middle school um, came from looking at the data, setting up committees that utilize the entirety of last school year to um, work on that data and come up with um, formulated ways to make sure that we have success moving forward. Awesome, thank you. Any other questions for this one? Did anyone have any questions on pets? I mean, I had a comment. You know, I saw that they did a survey and they only had 35 uh, people respond to their survey. And I apologize because I don't think I called, I don't think I uh, responded to the survey. I think that's because of the platform that was used for the survey. I think it's, uh, reaching out to parents and seeing uh, their opinion of how things are going in the school is very important and the issues that they have. And I don't disagree with any of the issues that were in the report. I think I would have answered them in the same way. So um, in the future, maybe looking at a different platform when you conduct that survey would improve the number that uh, respond. And then I, I saw a very nice explanation of the Title I services, um, the Title I update, and thank you for that. It's interesting, and I'm uh, trying to put that in perspective. And I look forward to taking the grant money related to Title I and, and, and leading the financial side of it from the Finance Committee in the uh, upcoming months. So thanks for that information. The only thing that I had for as I look at the current enrollment, and I know the numbers were high for fourth grade last year, but I see that we're currently at 21 to 1, and I just wanted to know how are we monitoring that number? Do we expect it to change? At what point is it too many? It's over 20 is a lot in fourth grade. Right. Do you want me to speak to that one, Catherine? Oh, sure. Yeah, but we, are, we haven't gotten it, so we've only received one new. Um, registration for third or fourth grade over the summer so far. We typically don't get as many, it's usually the pre k kindergarten that comes in. Um, so, and we do also, we just hired the ed tech um, at C. Godfrey, so we're working directly with third and fourth graders to provide introductions to them due to their high numbers. I heard her say they didn't have one application for third or fourth grade, I lost everything after that. I heard so. her say that they have an interventionist that they're going to be using okay. between third and Thank fourth you. grade. Yeah. I, as you remember from, I think last month, it could have been the month before, the number that I've been closely watching is the 85 in kindergarten, and that was a number I had, um, weren't not the right word, but a number I was very concerned about. Um, we had an increase of five uh, a few days ago.
give a thumbs up. So this is streaming. Let's see. Yes, it's still working. The feed is still broadcasting. Okay, great. Thank you. What was I talking about? Kindergarten? Yeah. So a few, I think it was a week ago, it could be two now. We gained five, but then this usually doesn't happen. We actually lost five in almost simultaneously through moving. So right now we're still at 85, and the number I told you is about 91, 92. So we are holding at the five classrooms currently in. All right, next up, all the miscellaneous um, reports for the admin, that would be uh, curriculum guidance, AD report, et cetera. Yeah, the curriculum, I had a note that there's a main two of the year assessment. You know, those, those assessments, it's absolutely, and it's the same assessment that Supreme was talking about. When can we expect those? And then how can they be broken down? I know I, I, I spoke with Mr. Grant about, um, you know, information drives decisions, and I'm a resource manager that looks at if we've got an issue in a certain grade, we as resource managers, budget managers, should look at that. Um, and then I'd like to see a, a format where rather than trying to push all three principles through all in one night, have a quarterly, you know, each principal speaks quarterly, so we'd be able to spend some more time with the information they have, specifically to their student assessments. And that's why the main two of the year assessments, I see that there was the administrative report came through, and then I believe there was another somewhere that they're looking for parent friendly. Um, it's just how, how can we get that data, and then can we break it into small chunks so that every month we can deal with a specific school see what issues they have so we can actually address them rather than just hear you and say thank you. Oh, that's a good idea. Thank you. I can speak a little bit about the result timeline. Do we not like they do? Okay. So we got an email from the main DOE on July 18th. Um, it said that our score reports, preliminary student score files will be on July 24th, which we received. Um, that's the information I've provided to you. They said instructional area grade scores and achievement level score reports are anticipated in mid-September. They did say that this is the only time that we're going to see this major delay in the time that we get the results. They've said this year after year after year, um, but we've been given a timeline right now of mid-September from the state of Maine. Perhaps something the board would entertain when Mr. Driver was the superintendent. All three principals gave a report in respective months, like in November, December, January, or out December, January, February. Because, like Mr. Friedman said, September I think is optimistic. Um, I think by the time you get it, you analyze it, and then you are have it ready for public consumption, like a board. Um, you know, I think November is pretty reasonable. But when those scores come out, we can certainly plan something like that, where the principals can report out on their three respective buildings. It's whatever order makes the most sense. I just don't know when the results will actually come out. That's the only challenge. I'm sure it's standardized. Is there, like when I study to take the test, I would say, look at the screen and tell me how many out of how many did you come home and tell me, you know, it's kind of, I could gauge whereabouts where he was based on how many questions he had. It seems hard to believe that you would take an exam and not know some sort of information about our school. It doesn't give you some sort of data you can print out. So prior to this spring, we had that ability. And then the state of Maine was told by the federal government that we were not following the federal guidelines around assessment and that our assessment results were not valid. Um, so they went through this process pretty quickly from January through March and released the information in March about what this new test would be. And the reason they are delaying the results this time according to them is because they are validating that they are consistent with what we expect across the federal level. The NOIA scores are instantaneous or within 24 hours. But I remember a day, Mr. Walsh probably remembers a day when it was the NBA and it was not until the next, you know, you take it in the spring and you wouldn't get it until October or November. So this is not uncommon. We've just been spoiled because we've had an NBA test for the last three or four years. And, and not, not that the state of Maine does anything incorrect.
correctly. The fact of the matter is they utilized the assessment tool that was not approved, and now they are trying to validate, calibrate the scores after we took the assessment that was not intended to be used in such a way. So we're back to, and I can go through the 15 different assessments we've used in my 22 years here. So we're dealing with them trying to figure that out. So I have a spreadsheet that I'm sure Mr. Freeman did as well that had 135 columns on it, and I deleted all the three, but even those scores are raw scores. So I, I'm not trying to be caught, I'm not trying to caution anyone, but we need to know from the state the calibration of validation before we can even look at a 247. I can look at the media and I know what that is. I don't yet know from the state what that is. So that's the that's the piece. What they send us is a spreadsheet. It's certainly not worthless, but it doesn't tell us what we need to know before we can then report it out and make changes from it. That's that's the difficult part. Are we still taking the readers in conjunction with this? Yes, ma'am. One of the only questions I had on the AD report says all high school students will get free admission. I wanted to make sure that all Harmon students are getting it free, correct? Like elementary and middle as well? Yeah, we just haven't figured out the card pass for that yet. We think we have a way to print ID cards for all students, and so we're just making sure that that can be done, and then that would be all Harmon school students. Will we take Micah's report separately, please? So, and then to your, what you just said, I had an idea. What if they print to be like negative pictures done? Is there a way for them to like print a photo roster that can be kept like if the person is checking at the booth? I know, let's say the kids forgot their card and then you can say, oh, you're, you know, Micah Grant, that looks like you, we love it in that way. Is it because of the timing of when pictures are done to oh, when yeah. the first game is? I don't know, I love, I love the idea though. It, it's just a, it's the vendor who we use for photos is different than the vendor that we're looking at for the cards, um, just because of the way that the capabilities of the two vendors, and we feel like the card vendor, this is what they do, they're designed to do it this way. Certainly in the future, we can look at ID cards that come right off of pictures, uh, but we just happen to choose this vendor and print card for, for all students. So, okay, I already spent the money. <laughs> Kind of move to facilities? Um, no, oh, um, let, let's take, let's take that under committee reports, if that's okay. Um, but I'd like, Haley also suggested separating out superintendent report as well, so let's, did you have questions specific on that? Uh, I did, so, with the recommendation of the IT director, do you plan to have that or is that job already So my plan right now, I would recommend to the school committee that we post an interim director position. Um, I think that it makes a lot of sense to bring somebody in, in the interim. Perhaps that, that could be somebody from the outside. It could also be somebody internal. Um, and then I think what we need to do is we need to have a network assessment done. And that way, I feel like we are going to then be able to dictate what we want in our next director. Um, because we might, if we hire the director and we then go into a season of getting RFPs, switching to MSLN, um, I, I just feel like the committee should steer what they want the school network to look like, and then we go and find a director that fits those needs. So my suggestion would be to post an interim, hire an interim director at the next meeting for the remainder of the school year, and then go through your RFP process, upgrade the network, fix the network, change the network, whatever that process looks like, and we're starting to get into those conversations at the tech committee level, and then post for a director in the spring and hire an IT director for the next school year, so July 1st of 2024. So are you saying you're, you're going to contract with outside agencies to find what we need to do to go forward, is that what I heard you say? So on Saturday, right now on Saturday or Sunday, one of the two days, we had a couple of virtual machines go down. I don't know exactly what that means, but Alan spent a significant amount of time on Sunday talking to Jeff 
and Bangor IT on how to fix those. He then, correct me if I'm wrong, you fixed the problem. Yes. And so what I would like to do is bring in a support company who can look at our network and help us currently until we can put a new network in place. Any additional questions on Micah's? Could you give an overview of the audit paperwork just for clarity? You have it in here about the E-Ray audit, but you didn't make any mention of it today. I didn't what? You, you have the E-Ray information in there, but you didn't give any comments to that. you want to give us an update on that? Or? Um, yeah, you have a, uh, I mean, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Audits in the packet and my responses in the packet. The only thing that's not there is the 256 page supporting document that we sent to USOC regarding the 20 year audit. Um, right now, I'm, I'm, I don't really have a lot to say beyond what I said in the letter, and we're just waiting to see what USOC comes back with as a result. Do you have a time frame we can expect? I had an opportunity to meet with Ben last week, and he came in and reviewed additional documents. Um, he didn't tell me anything that changed my mind from last month. Like, hey, we should expect something tomorrow or three weeks. So I, I don't have a time frame. Can possible outcomes be discussed? The survey is not. The audit has gone forward. Can we discuss any possible outcomes? Yeah, I mean, you can, you can discuss them. As you know, there's a wide range of outcomes. It could be seeking more information. It could be financial, um, and that trying to claw back money. And then that could result in another chain of reactions to, um, we obviously could file a lawsuit against the E-rate provider from any of the years that were listed. Um, we could obviously appeal to the FCC the, any decisions that were made. Um, so depending on what the outcome is, we then have chain reactions that the committee would have to decide on what it wants to do next. Um, and can you clarify, so this has nothing to do or won't affect penicillin at all, is that right? I've, so we can, we can switch over they're separate entities, so that won't have any effect. Yeah, no, this has, excuse me, this has no impact on MS1. I, and I hope people understand that this is not for this year, this is not for last year, this is from 02 to 22. So they're looking at a 20 year time frame, which I think you pick up from my letter. Uh, you know, we argued pretty vehemently against a audit that went past our federal mandate to keep records for 10 years. Um, we're, you know, pretty, pretty disappointed that they feel they have the authority to do that. So, um, right now we're waiting to see if they start going after money or if they request more information. So will that affect our funding in the meantime? Or we'll just, because I know you, I think you said the $350 rate for, um, for MSL and internet, will that have any effect? Current funding budget uh, I believe that our attorney advised that um, that it should not impact our ability to receive E-rate. It may increase our frequency of audit. So we can still apply. We still have a certain pool of money that we are eligible for. In MSLN's case, they'll be the ones applying for the E-rate funding, and you know then we just get the benefit of their internet at a discounted cost, obviously. Um, but if we were to apply for network upgrade and we were going to upgrade all our RAPs in the district, for example, and that's a tier two category, I'm just again completely hypothesizing that that costs $100,000. Just that's a that's just a guess. And we applied for 66% rate, which you re reimburses to us. We could we're still eligible for that, but we might have to we were going to have to keep very careful documentation because we're at risk now for another audit. You know, you're more likely to have it happen to you again. So it sounds like switching to MSLM will help this process and keep it, um, you know, maintain things and keep track of things and 
We, we switch, I think using MSLM, certainly using somebody that most schools use is obviously a benefit, but we switched ERA providers uh, two and a half years ago. Uh, excuse me, ERA consultants two and a half years ago, and we feel, as you all know from our uh, conversations, we feel very strongly about our documentation over the last three, two, three to four years, you know, since 1920 in that range. Uh, it's, it's the 16 years prior to that that concern us. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. Graham on the superintendent report? Hey, hey just got to announce that you're going to have the dates for the committees and yeah, there's some positive things in here that are yeah. being looked at. Yeah. Let me just get to my report so I don't give you the wrong date. So I had said this at the, we did a stacked tech committee and policy committee meeting on August 2nd, 1st, 1st, something. And uh, one of the things that I, I really liked about it was that tonight obviously we'll have the opportunity back but I really like the idea of having a standing meeting. I love the idea of having a staff meeting. Um, they might be a little bit you know long afternoons but at the same time um, it just allows you to transition from one thought to the next and they're always a little you know about six days before a school committee meeting and I think that's really advantageous for the committee members. It's good for me. It gives me three weeks to do any research, it gives you time if you're part of a committee or you're going on a tour somewhere, things like that. So at that meeting, I had initially said I'd like to do it Thursday for school committee meetings. However, the packet comes out on Thursday. And so if there was any change, if we drafted a new naloxone policy, for example, out of those meetings, that would require an agenda adjustment item. And obviously, we try to avoid it. Those especially, you don't want to agenda adjust for policy. Like, that's not a good... That's not a good thing to adjust for. So, um, my, I was wondering what the committee or how the committee felt. I would like to do standing meetings, and right now I've got tech committee, finance committee, and policy committee for September 5th. That's six days before the September 11th school committee. And I have 3, 4, and 5. It may end up being like 3, 4, 5, 5, you know, 5, 10. But, but regardless, uh, they'd be right there at the high school. And then when I get the facilities, um, document back, then I'll start working in that committee as well. Um, that could be on a different day, just because we might tour a site, and I can see that maybe on a different day, but I really like the idea of stacking uh, those three committees, but I did change the name from Tuesday, from Thursday to Tuesday. So it'll be a standing meeting, uh, typically the Tuesday before the board meeting, I think that that just provides the opportunity for committee members to be able to plan ahead, and community members that want to be able to attend, so I really like the idea. And then the plan would be for the agenda to come out on Thursday or Friday before that Tuesday, similar to a school committee meeting, and it would give people the opportunity on those committees to meet with me, work on the agenda, post it on Thursday, Friday, and then you have your meeting on Tuesday, and we can post another agenda for school committee on Thursday, and then have a school committee meeting Monday. Nope, I like the idea of having the same committees and have them on it regular basis and on a predictable date. I think it's great. Great idea. I was really excited with everybody that volunteered to be on the different committees because as chair I could have just named names, but I think it's important to be able to see what did everybody want to be able to volunteer to help with and I love the fact that some people have stepped up and are taking minutes, you know, to be able to help with those and really taking the lead on those. So thank you guys for the collaboration there. One of the things that we are looking into is policy and how to make that a uh, either entire committee or a workshop. That way people can come give their opinion, uh, give a thought, no vote. But then when we get here, similar to tonight, it's just, I mean, not that we can't have discussion, but it just moves four hour meetings to discuss a policy that we could do on September 5th in an hour. Uh, I just think it makes for a better experience and more, you know, gives more feedback. So I'm working in the how, thinking about how to do that from a workshop model. Um, I haven't got that all squared away yet. I had mentioned that finance also being a, a, a big one that causes a lot of conversation and a lot of input would be good. So it, like we said, it's a workshop. They don't have to be there, but if we are, we're allowed to have a seat at the table and have discussion. Great feedback. And we'll get back to you on that. Okay. Fine. Uh, we're actively working on 
um, to contract with our SU 87 states, that they have to have equal representation right now. I recognize that as chair, I, I don't have to be the one. And honestly, I want input from others on there. So that's why we're, we're looking to see what we can do. Because I want the input from others at the policy committee meeting. And where will those be posted? We updating that that was one of the goals last year you can write your goals for it for this year but we're going to be posting those meetings so that the public can know well uh, we're going to post them i can ask for that uh, i don't i don't know if you're going to post them so they'll be posted right where they normally are and now that we'll have the freestanding dates and if we as a committee all agree that you know we're okay with the september 5th then i would assume jody think we'll post them as soon as possible right yeah, post the time, the dates, agenda, just before. All right, so let's move to those subcommittee reports. Um, anything for facilities, track, and safety? Brian, I know you had something for some facilities. Yeah, on the facility report, not necessarily the facilities committee. You saw, um, see, you showing me, I was probably last about it, you taking me out of sequence. Oh, PFAS. I saw the water uh, treatment issues on PFAS that uh, there's been a delay. I just wonder if there's any updates or timeline on that. There's been a delay on the design. And then are there any additional costs that as a result of the delays are happening with the PFAS issue? The, obviously, Brian, there will be one cost added and that's additional water. As far as the, to the system, I don't know if there's an additional cost either in the design and engineering of it or is the carbon filter going to be a bigger size. Um, so I don't know. I'll have to get more information on that cost or potential that cost. Um, we are being reimbursed uh, and have a bit given approval for a federal grant for this. So we I'll have to just see if we've exceeded that threshold if there is such a cost. So I can give you more information on that. Yeah, I mean, obviously PFAS is a, an emotional uh, subject for a lot of people, so I'd like to keep it, uh, keep the information flowing on it. Anything on finance committee? I know you guys haven't met yet. Did I miss something? Uh, finance, on the finance committee stock facility. Did you have something you wanted to add? I, I just add? saw the note on the motor fuel tank status that they could be where it was planned, and I just wanted to make sure it was in the public that the, um, the motor fuel tank installation has changed, and just if there was any additional information on it. So the new tank cannot be installed uh, in the same location as the existing tank. If there's just any more information that we want to make that public. We're just looking at alternative sites specifically behind the you know where the garage is? We're looking at putting it behind the garage at the middle school instead of uh, currently at City Drive in the middle school parking lot. You got your 9 10 buses, and then you have a slight drop off fuel tank. And we're looking at moving it behind that garage. Ledge is becoming a huge problem right now with our site. And so, a couple alternative sites that we've looked at, we cannot because there's too much ledge. So, we are looking at behind the garage at the middle school. Have they considered putting it on the municipal side of the property where the fire trucks fuel up? I don't know if discussion we have with the council or if that's even an option or how that would be uh, navigated. But just so it's not near water, the wells, and tight spaces in the future moving, and that way the municipal is kind of controlling where all the fuel is in one spot. I don't know if it's worthy for discussion or not, it's just an idea. Yeah, that's something I can talk with Jason and then obviously talk to Josh about. Um, one of the benefits for having a middle school placement is our buses are there already, so they don't have to drive up to right, like where that location might be. And just keeping it on that site allows us to have, um, uh, it just eases into the fueling up process and the traffic pattern. But I can ask. I don't I don't have a I don't personally have a preference. I'm sure Jason I know Jason would like to keep it at the middle school for that reason. Okay. Right. And anything else? Yeah, I mean, the finance committee hasn't had a chance to 
meet yet, but I did have you know a couple questions, comments. If you were the financial board, obviously, we we'll keep it for the first finance committee. Just kind of as a general, did the, did the July budget meet or exceed the projected cost expectations for July? We are at a 6.2 percent of the overall budget in one month. You know, are we on a, a flat line budgeting for a month, or do we do the cyclical? Budget is based on months. I mean, do you have a forecast for each month and you get July's numbers? Do you, mean, you want to speak to just that forecasting? I know we're still tying things out, but. Revenues we took in and the expenses we paid out 
that is the change to fund balance. So as long as we're still trying to tie those bills and expenses out at the end of the fiscal year, that change to undesignated is going to continue until we until the books are complete. So the amount, the amount that you're going to put toward the undesignated will change, but you're not drawing off of the undesignated. It can go. It can go either way. It depends on if the revenues are higher or if the expenses are higher. If, we, if our revenues are higher, our actual revenues are higher than our actual expenditures, then we will be adding money to undesignated fund balance. If our expenditures are higher than our revenues, we will be taking money away from that net change to fund balance. But until we know what the change for the fiscal year is, we won't know what the total undesignated fund balance is. Do you know what approximately we're in? Six figures, what the change maybe could look at over eight hundred thousand um, dollar. I do not have the report in front of me. Can you tell me what column you're seeing the eight hundred thousand in? Are you seeing that in the budget remaining column? Yes. Okay, um, so under June under the June first through June thirtieth, twenty twenty three. Okay. So again the the that budget column, the budget remaining column, is not going to have the effect on fund balance. You have to look at actual revenues versus actual expenditures. So I believe, off the top of my head, forgive me if I'm wrong, um, the expenditures are, well, the expenditures are a positive number on the report, and the revenue shows a negative at the top. And if you look at the very last page of that June report, I believe it is a positive somewhere in the vicinity of $200,000. Right. Am I somewhere as close? Yes. Okay. Two twenty one. Um, so that number is positive. As of right now, we are actually taking away from our undesignated fund balance. Interesting word. <laughs> think, think of it like your checking account. When you have when you take more money in from your job and you deposit it into your checking account, you're increasing the amount of available funds that you have. But if you are spending your money faster than it's coming in, you're taking away, now you're giving in your savings, you're taking away from it. It's the same idea. Perhaps I'm saying the wrong thing. Undesignated fund is the surplus amount that's money's left over that we've been... That it kind of. It is accumulation of the net of that over the course of the years. So right. it's not one singular year. So we have an FY22 undesignated undesignated fund balance, which is what the auditor reported at the last, um, but when he did his presentation at the last meeting, I can't give you FY23 because I don't know what the, F, what the FY23 net change to fund balance is going to be. We're not done with those transactions that affect that undesignated change. It's cumulative each, each year. It's cumulative. Any other questions for Jane? We're in the black for 23, right? <laughs> uh, as far as how much revenues over expenditures, yep. as of right now, the expenditures are over revenues. Remember, the revenues come in all throughout the year. We don't get all the revenues up front from the state. From right. tuition, they come in monthly, or monthly installments. Right. So, like Jamie said, currently we are on pace to draw off the designated fund balance, correct? Correct. Okay. By right now, two hundred twenty-one thousand five hundred sixty-three dollars and eighty-one cents. As of right now, but that number is it's going to change. And it's going to change. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, did you say twenty-three or twenty-four? Is that twenty-three? Okay.
and there's a couple that we have to change some dates of the letter, letters on the superintendents. I believe it's the superintendent's evaluation is miscoded, so we just need to change a code. But those were the two I was thinking of for policy committee. Did anybody have anything for the future? I know there was. Cert and certainly in the lock zone, just a follow up to make sure that that was legally uh, yes. kosher. I know there was some concerns about some very old policies. Did anybody have any, but any that they wanted us to tackle in the future? Maybe not next time, but in the future? If you could just keep saying it's a subcommittee. Policy. Yeah. Subcommittee. I'd like to be able to yeah, have, have one. I, I have from, if you go to the portal of SBA, you're at the top there, you can edit. Okay. That one's going to ask for. So even if we didn't tackle it in September, I'd like yeah, to see yeah. it in the future. Okay. Um, next, technology committee. Uh, I will speak to that, I guess. And then also, I did want to just give an update on facilities track. Um, I had the benefit of going out and seeing the track looks amazing. Uh, the uh, turf looks amazing. And uh, it sounds like the track is ahead of schedule, so that's awesome too. And it sounds like the town is working hard um, to do. Steve's here too, he was there. Um, Fundraising and, and uh, right, Sinclair. Yeah, to, to do fundraising to help offset the cost and, and benefits of adding cameras or more lighting or things like that. So, that's a for tech. Um, for tech, I guess we've heard most of it. We talked about our current provider being First Light, um, switching over and the timeline to do that. We have a tomorrow with RSU 22 to see how they are set up and to send you this a possible guide and to meet with some consultants there. Um, talked about the cost savings and what it might cost for internet being around 350 possibly dollars a month versus the 4200 we're currently paying. A long list here. I did tell you, you're agreeing on tape. Um, inventory and apps. Okay. Inventory and apps. Oh yes, the inventory and the apps. So you can kind of see what teachers and, and staff are actually using, what it costs, um, it's beneficial. You can down some of those. And you had said that Alan um, had things to add into this. I didn't get any update from you, so. I just haven't forwarded along. I haven't reviewed it yet, but Alan uh, did notes as well. So we had two note takers. I didn't have the chance to blend the two, but we've got more notes. So. And then there was the possibility if MSLN wouldn't take us on that we may have to do an RFP for internet again for ourselves, and that's something that we may have to look at too, but hopefully that won't be the case. Thank you. You guys certainly accomplished a lot in that one meeting, so thank you. No um, spruce update that I know of. Um, no. Oh, do you? No. Okay. I don't think so. I thought it was too early in the year to be meeting. Um, let's go around and talk about possible future agenda items. I did want to add one that's the time of year to talk about our committee goals. And so we will be talking about those next month. So I'd love input um, from people on if they have anything that they want to add to that. And would you like me to ask Jody to send what we had last year, what you had last year? You read my mind, yes, please, that would be great. So yes, we'll send what there was last year, and I really would like feedback from the committee on that. I have a couple of questions for follow-up. Um, Chris had asked for us to change meeting schedules. Is that, you didn't have that listed, is that all set now, or? Yep, I want to be able to keep um, everything as is. Um, for as much as we can, thank you for bringing that back up. Um, I want to just be able to keep the, I think it's important to have the schedule as is, and I don't want to change it, say, if I'm not able to attend, if you're not able to attend, I just think it's important that we stay with the schedule, so, perfect. And, um, oh, we have another meeting in August, are we still going to keep that on there? That, that was an as needed for hiring one. Um, and so I don't need that meeting right now for hiring. So we'll just leave it or? What if we need to do that? Yeah, I 
it was just that as we were going to implement it as needed tonight. So we don't need to do that. And I am going to be sending you a couple of dates for training to do a workshop with Maine School Board Association and Maine School Management Association. That was Eileen King and Steve Bailey. And so they're going to come. And I'll send out a couple of dates. And then they'll ask, I'll ask you what your availability is. And then we'll have a workshop. Uh, we feel like that. That way it can be public, and that way everyone can hear what they say about the roles, responsibilities, question and answers of school committees. Yeah. We're looking at, they, they're pretty booked, um, just because I hadn't planned on using them. So we're looking at probably a little bit more in September for that date, and we were initially thinking August with our attorney in training. So um, it'll, you're looking at probably uh, mid-September for that. So I'll get you a couple of dates. Any other? Thank you for all the questions. This is great. Thank you for bringing those points up. Um, Chris, do you have any agenda items? Jesse? Haley? Facilities meeting dates. Let's start those. Yeah, so I'll send you a date. I don't have one yet, but I'll send you a couple of dates. And is it you, Jesse? Yeah, so we'll plan a date. I really wanted to get the proposal like you and I talked about last week before scheduling a date because I didn't want to do one without that proposal in hand. But we can schedule a meeting and we'll do a tour or something. So you get start seeing the buildings and start seeing the needs. Anything else? Yeah, I'm, I'll Brian, send it yeah. an email. I mean, like I've been sending it for email, so I'll just do that while I'm good to go. Okay, yeah. Can I add one yeah. possible agenda items? So one of the things that I forgot to mention in the principal's report and that I saw walk back was we have been reviewing the, uh, the, the very limited number of applications that have been coming in for attendance volume. That's his cue. <laughs> well, I'm standing there. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> and, uh, and we're, we're not having many. And then as you know from a meeting or two ago, um, a very good attendance monitor our third or fourth one at five years. <laughs> <laughs> Brian's here. Um, do you know? <laughs> uh, he moved on to be an educational technician, worked with the kids, classroom experience, and just, it, it is a tough job uh, because you're, you're chasing attendance and you're calling homes, and it, it's, it, it's, it's a very challenging position. So um, instead of looking at two, attendance monitors, one to fill and one to, uh, the new one that was created by the budget, we had a thought of combining the two um, and hiring a dean of attendance and academics. And that would be a teaching position. And I did a, a sample draft policy just for your consumption. And I'd like you to take a look at it. And I asked Mr. Walsh just to speak a little bit to that great job. Thank you. So after last meeting, um, Haley, you actually said something that great to something in public comments and it kind of got my brain going. Uh, we've gone through four attendance monitors in the last five years. And I got together with my uh, building level administrative team after the last meeting and we kind of talked about, okay, how do we get retention in that position? Um, we've had some really good people, but they use it as a intro one year, get out, get a better job intro come in, I'd rather work with kids in a positive way, et cetera, et cetera. So, got to thinking, got to talking. Uh, we have area school that does a position like this, and what's nice about it is it's on the teaching scale. So, you're looking at a dean position, not another administrator, um, but our numbers have increased since I've been here in 22 years, and the needs of our kids have increased, and our attendance rate has gone down. Our chronic absentee has gone up. We thought about balancing that position with something positive, which is the academic side. And um, Kevin Berry was fantastic last year, but he said at the end of the year, he was, I want to work with kids in a positive light. I want to work with kids in the classroom. Um, and, it, and it makes sense. Um, so what, we're, what we looked at was, okay, how could we combine the attendance piece with something positive? What we could do is, in a dean position, because we can balance the attendance side and the truancy side and the chronic absenteeism side with improving classroom instruction. Um, those are two very different areas, but I think it's a skill set we could find by making that position. Um, 
the position would, I think, be a nice balance with, the, with uh, Steve in the SRO position. Uh, he fills a huge void that we didn't have. And even in the few months he was here, we saw a huge positive impact of his presence. So because we have him in the halls and the cab and the men's rooms, et cetera, uh, we have another presence already in that capacity. So if you're looking at this position and saying, okay, you're focusing on the academic, you're back focusing on the attendance side, something we need to improve. Um, we do it from a dean perspective where this isn't someone who's on an hourly paycheck, who's only here or seven hours a day. Um, on the teacher contract, we look at it and we say, okay, we, we would have it when we need them. They can do additional duties, events, games, etc. They can see the kids in a different light, not only from chasing them, but also for helping improve instruction. And we think we could hopefully then get someone who wants to stay for more than a year, uh, because that's been our big, biggest issue. Uh, four good people, and still good, still good people, but again, they only have three per year. And so we try to figure out that we think it's the best way to do it. Um, we want someone who has um, the teaching experience, the professional development experience. Uh, I'd be looking for someone when I go to class to evaluate a teacher, and we come up with a plan and areas to improve. It'd be nice to have in-house PD. It's something we used to have here. We had the instructional coach model pre-COVID, and then that came in and kind of blew everything up. It'd be nice to have that, and that would give the person in this position a balance of, okay, I'm working on getting the kids here, going to the home, doing the visit, um, doing the attendance from a positive side. Um, by the time they reach my level, it's the 10-day letter, 15-day letter, loss of credit, whether et cetera, but also to give them the position where, okay, this is going to help. Um, they need the a liaison when I kids on long-term absence, which we saw a huge increase in that over the last three years. Um, it would give us uh, kind of on-the-grounds person to make that connection. Um, I, I just think in, in having someone who does the job that we've had the last four years, they, they don't stay um, because of that side of it. And I think that this would uh, be enticing enough some of the, of the educational experience where we could give them a balance. Uh, the individuals I've had in that position don't have a teaching credential, they don't have a certification um, outside of an EdTech, and I, I think this is a way where we can actually hopefully find someone who is interested in being here for more than one school year and moving on, because we really need that consistency if it's possible. Uh, we have two positions in the budget, um, we're having hard enough time kind of for one of them. Uh, I think it's fortunate that we saw that and we put that in, but this was the brainchild that happened after the last meeting, and uh, we worked together and we opened the job description. Hopefully it's something you can take a look at, and then we could uh, visit. So I just want to make sure that we're talking about bringing this position for approval for an agenda item for next month. So right now I would bring the job description for approval in September, and then we post and then hire that position after that. Okay. So it's not an ideal time frame, but the plan would be to bring the job description forward, uh, let the next three and a half weeks go by, see what we continue to get for applications, but then to change course. Uh, we're almost a wash financially uh, when you look at the two positions. So you're, you're looking at mid-40s for both attendance monitors when you factor in salary and benefits, but you get a fixed time frame, right? We can hire a teacher, somebody on the teaching scale who has the appropriate qualifications, and you're looking at roughly you know, forty to sixty thousand dollars in salary, and then another right fill in the benefits. So I figured them both to be a wash. You were going to spend eighty-five thousand for two people, or you could spend eighty to eighty-five thousand for potentially one really strong candidate who could do, frankly, who could do something that's also incredibly valuable in the um, attendance. So we're not writing off the attendance yet, but we feel like we have to shift course based upon just what we're seeing uh, that's coming in. And you may have noticed last meeting the attendant secretary resigned um, and has moved to Portland. So um, that's another hole that we're trying to fill right now. So it's, a, it's not a big number. But. Okay, so did you say that this person would do the house visits? Well, I, I um, think that was, that was a law enforcement So thing. I'm looking at, so we, we, we wouldn't just send the SRO, um, whether it's a guidance of counselor or it's a academic dean or what have you. Um, I'm looking at this person a positive liaison between the family and the school. And I say positive because, again, what I send out is the letters that have the language about the law, and when, by the time they meet with me, they're losing credit. Um, I want somebody who can be a positive. The people we've had in that position have been really positive. 
and have worked well with they work a seven hour day, that's where it ends. I'm looking at this person with you know, more salary, so it's okay. We can have them be part of that process as well, if, if it makes sense. If it's a risky visit, then no, it would not be, it would be a principal, or if it's a principal along with the SRO. That was my other question as far as do you find that those jobs aren't being filled because of the wages? Is that the returns or is it just schools in general? They do the job for a year and it's not a fun job. Yeah, because it sounded like you needed extra hands in the school. There is, we, and we do. And we want to make sure we're supporting the safety of the issues that have been going on. We do, but we, we're facing the same world that everyone else is when it comes to certain positions. We're not getting uh, 20 hours. We're, we're getting people who, again, they do a year, it sounds good, it's great hours um, for some people, and then they do the position, and again, over the last five years, all four people have left. So um, we're trying to find something where maybe we get some retention, and then maybe we can have them have a positive side of the job, which would be the academic side, and then um, put them in some other positions outside of just those two. That's, that's where my head has gone to, to think it's someone qualified and who wants to be, you know, who, who will stay for the year. Is this going to get you and Steph Bieberstein out of the lunch room? <laughs> I tell you what, I think we should ask our parents to volunteer in the lunch room. I don't know. The, the reality is, I mean, so when you've got 185 or 200 high school kids in the cap, you got to have people in the cap. And, um, I would, I, I, right now, we're, I'd, love, I'd love to come up with a solution to that, but quite frankly, at, at the end of the day, there is not a great solution. No, I get it. It's just, it goes back to that highest and best use of time is what it comes down to for me. So that's the, the only reason why I ask. Yeah. Stephanie would love to be out of the, the uh, cafeteria. So this person would fill the job of the attendance person you have now, plus sort of be a home monitor. I would, we, we would utilize a skill set that would allow them to help us with the attendance side, but also with the academic side, which I haven't had. Is that like when you have a substitute? I'm just trying to understand. So when you have a substitute, you already need a substitute. Have on this person can fill in. Uh, well, as any of us do, correct. And so it doesn't solve the hallway problem. Um, well, again, so, I. I'm not against your idea. I'm yeah. saying I, it doesn't sound like this solves it either. It sounds like you still need hall help. Again, I, it would not, when I was in high school, there were probably six regular ed techs who were all monitors, bathroom monitors. Those days are long gone. Those people no longer exist. Um, so I, it doesn't solve it, but I think having another person. We can wear many hats is probably not a bad idea. And again, I'm trying to figure out how we can have someone in that position for more than a year. Right. Yeah. Which will give us some traction and hopefully get a positive result from that. If we have further questions, um, certainly um, send Brian an email, include Mike and I on it just so we know um, what your thoughts are. What was that? Yeah. How are we looking overall as a district or as a department? Are there any critical vacancies that are still out there? That just the attendance um, secretary here, not attendance secretary, we, uh, we need an administrative assistant here at the high school. And then potentially these two attendance monitors or a dean of students. Um, I believe we are, who are you pointing at? Alicia. We hired her. No, no. Oh, now we're going to need a self-contained teacher at the elementary school. Yeah. Can we just hire her? We have three of those who are currently open, so yeah. Probably the three vacancies in high school. We have the two monitors and then the secretary. Do you advertise anywhere other than in serving schools? Um, I would have to check with Jody on that because some positions we do and some like teaching positions we do not advertise outside of serving schools. The the last I'm gonna I'm gonna say this. The last time our um, attended sector position was open, pre-COVID, we had sixty one applicants. On serving schools. Uh, this time we have not. Wow. Maybe we can just list open positions on the administrative reports. I think that's a good idea so that we would know if there was 10 teachers missing, which there wouldn't be. Yeah, that's something that um, I can put into my report, especially in the summertime where it's helpful to know. But we, I know it doesn't sound like it, we're actually in a really good spot compared to last year at this time. I hired several people in the middle of August, several teachers in the middle of August last year. Brian, did you have any other agenda items? I think we're going to answer that. Thanks, Brian.
Thank you. Um, let's now take um, the approval of the warrants as a group. I'm trying to look. It looks like there's 11 of them. Do I have a motion to approve the warrants as presented? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All the, oh, any discussion? All those in favor? Motion carries. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Have a second. Motion to adjourn at eight twenty-seven. Is there a second? I missed this call. Second. Yeah. Second. All right. Brian, are you in favor? Perfect. Thank you.